Oh, Hello, hey. everyone. This is uh, Critical Materials Corner. I'm Byron King with Jack Lifton. And today we have a very special uh, guest, Constantine Karinopoulos of Neo Performance Materials. Constantine, you have been a you've been a fixture of the rare earth world as well as uh, other exotic metals for you know a long time. And I won't embarrass any of us by saying you know, how far back how far back it goes. Uh, it's you have an astonishing personal and you know business track record, and you're running a, a very successful uh, company right now. Uh, give us give us just a real quick you know one minute elevator summary of where things stand uh, with with what you're going because I have lots of you know deeper questions but for people who are perhaps new to the story or the idea t tell tell them tell them what it is you do because it's quite a story. Sure, thanks, Byron, and thanks for not calling me old, but I've been called a lot worse than fixture. So <laughs> um, the uh, yeah the, the company has been around for uh, thirty years uh, or so. In fact. One of our divisions that makes magnetic materials has been around since, you know, for 40 years. And our rare metals plant in Estonia has been around since the 20s. So we're, we're a collection of uh, uh, what uh, on the surface would appear is a disparate collection of uh, assets um, and people. Uh, but what we do is uh, we, we buy rare earths from mining companies, rare earth concentrates from mining companies. We refine them to a very large degree. We... Be, we take them beyond sort of the, um, the separation stage and we add uh, a lot more value by turning them into um, specialties that a lot of folks will you know, pay us um, a good amount of money for, whether in the catalytic material space or the electronic space. And in one of our divisions, we take these rare earths even further. We turn them into metals, alloys, and magnetic powders, as well as magnets. And we, we have a, a very strong franchise in the small magnet, small motor uh, area where our magnets impart um, energy efficiency, precision, complex shapes, light weighting, etc. So we sit in sort of the midstream of the rare earth supply chain. Um, where we were essentially a collection of engineers, scientists, material scientists, chemical engineers, mechanical, electrical engineers, and so on. And we just add value to stuff that comes out of the ground and we turn them into the products that sit on your desk, you wear in your wrist, you have them in your pocket and you drive them in, uh, on the road. So, you know, it's, it's a fun business. We're doing well. I, but in fact, we've always done well um, after breaking even in quarter number five in 1995 uh we've been consistently profitable um and in these days um we're i guess perhaps even more profitable than we would normally be given what's happening with supply demand the volatility and pricing and the like mm, wonderful jack jack i know that you have uh, a question or two that you wanted to ask why don't you why don't you kick off with constantine and and uh, uh Yes. Good morning, Constantine. I uh, do have a question. Since you are the only truly non-Chinese global rare earth company, uh, and you you have significant operations in Europe. In fact, I believe you're operating the only rare earth separation plant in Europe. Uh, but now there's turmoil in in the European uh, scene. And I'd like to ask you, how is the situation in Eastern Europe affecting your business, your rare earth products business in Europe? Right. Well, great question, Jack. And of course, uh, I, I might make a minor correction. There is another rare earth facility in France, but it's essentially idled. It, it reprocesses separated material. So we're the only commercially operating rare earth facility uh, in Europe, but perhaps uh, in the fullness of time, there will be others. Uh, for the time being, yeah, we're the only game in town. Um, so listen, as I said in my um, earnings call a couple of weeks ago, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge trage tragedy uh, what's going on in Ukraine. And um, I think the world is letting all of us down and, and the powers that be um, really need to be doing a much better job ensuring that people don't die uh, 
unnecessarily and aimlessly in, 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 in tragic conditions like this. So in the larger scheme of things, the issues around rare supply chains are very secondary to the, to the human tragedy that's been unfolding over the last uh, month in, in, in Ukraine. Having that, leaving that aside, you know, we all have responsibilities to our stakeholders, to our customers, to our employees, uh, the communities that, that, that we operate. So it, it behooves us to, to keep going um, as hard as we can. So we've been very um, successful so far, running without interruptions, but it's not an easy thing. I mean, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I, I look for is emails from our lawyers or our plant in Estonia, uh, letting us know how things are going because you know, I, 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 I guess um, it's, it's a fact that about two thirds of our materials, of our raw materials for our plant in, uh, in Estonia come from Russia. Uh, and in the rare earth industry, you have an oper you know, the operating mines in Russia and Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Myanmar, and so on. You have a mine in Australia, the Linus operates and a separation plant in Malaysia. And then you have a Russian uh, mine in the north of Russia, which uh, is operating, has been operating for 30, 40 years, 50 years. Uh, and we get our raw materials or, or two thirds of our raw materials from there. Um, however, um, we've been fortunate enough that, as, as you know, and we've talked about it before, uh, we did a deal with Energy Fuels. We, we started a couple of years ago, and now fully a third of our materials, and we're growing that, our raw materials rather, uh, come from Energy Fuels in Utah, where Energy Fuels is utilizing a byproduct uh, monazite uh, uh, stream that they process in Utah, and they send us the the rare earth raw materials for uh, processing in, in Estonia. So we're not as dependent on Russia uh, and our Russian suppliers, who by the way, we've had zero problems for the last 30, 40 years. They've, they've been very reliable, very high quality. Um, so uh, we continue to do that. They, we, we check almost daily to make sure that this company is not on any sanctions because you know at the end of the day, we want to make sure that whatever we do is, is absolutely legal. Uh, both morally and, and ethically defensible. Um, so this company exports to the United States, exports to, uh, to Estonia. So, so far, so good. Uh, however, we can't rely just on that. So we're um, in, in our, all of our conversations with energy fuels are um, about expediting their next campaign and shipping us more raw materials, which they're doing. Uh, and we're very grateful to Mark Chalmers and, and the team uh, at Energy Fuels for being able to respond very quickly uh, and, and, and helping us out with it. So our Estonian plant is running like normal, is running flat out. Uh, we have a few other uh, issues that we're dealing with because some of our other reagents uh, are coming from the Ukraine. Um, but that's a fairly common problem for Europe because a lot of um, especially the automotive industry and the, and the chemicals industry relies on, on raw materials, reagents, acids, ammonia, things like that that come from the Ukraine. Um, Volkswagen buys all of its cables for its um, cabling systems and the automobiles that they built from the Ukraine. So um, this is creating you know, disruptions in the supply chain. Uh, but so far, we've been able to, to respond. Our folks have, uh, have been working really hard uh, on the ground. Um, and so far, so good. You know, knock on wood, um, we're, we're good. At, at the same time, we, uh, we're, we're hiring more people in Estonia from the Ukraine. Uh, the Estonian government has a program to, to um, uh, accelerate the, the applications uh, from uh, folks in the Ukraine. And, uh, and we're working with them. And... Um, you know, we're doing what we can, uh, but in the meantime, uh, we have a great responsibility to, to our communities and our folks to, to, and our customers to keep running as hard as we can. Well, I would like to just uh, go now beyond Europe and ask you a question about your global operation. Uh, I, I want to amend, amend, e -M -E -N -D, uh, Byron's uh, comments on magnets, because I know that your company specializes in what are called bonded magnets, which is the distribution of magnetic powders in a, a resin carrier, so to speak, and then their uh, solidification to the desired shape and magnetization. All right, fine, I'll say, having said that, it's my 
typically most of the magnets of the world are centered. Uh, they're a different type. But it's my understanding that your company not only pioneered bonded magnets, but remains the leading supplier of this type of magnet in the world. And having said that, I want to ask you a question. It's my understanding also that certain automotive manufacturers are working with you to replace the centered magnet with the, your bonded magnet in, in applications in, in electric vehicles. And it seems to me that would be a dynamite future business for your company. Um, um, that was a, that was a very good description, Jack. I, I'd, give you, <laughs> I, I'd give you a 90 of this, but I'll, I'll correct you on one thing. Okay. Yes, we, you know, the, the, the bonded magnet space uh, is the smaller um, of the two, meaning bonded versus centered. Um, about 90% of, or 95% of all the magnets, uh, the rare earth magnets in the world are centered neo. We mm -hmm. don't play in that yet. Uh, in the bonded magnet, though, uh, space, we, we dominate that uh, space. We have about a two-thirds market share uh, in the magnetic materials that go into these bonded magnets. And as of three years ago, we started making those magnets ourselves, and we had to Im implement three different uh, expansion strategies for our manufacturing capacity. So that is true. Uh, that has been our bread and butter for years. And in fact, our magnet quench division uh, was the original inventor of the neodymium iron boron magnet. So we know a thing or two about how to make rare earths uh, have, get the right magnetic properties. What has happened in Europe, as you very rightly pointed out, is that we have been, you know, we've, we've had our arms twisted very hard uh, by the automotive supply chains. Uh, by our tier one customers who produce drivetrains, drivetrain motors, as well as other auxiliary motors for automobiles. I mean, in the average car um, with say a medium level car with a reasonable amount of uh, uh, power functions, you'd have 140, 150 small motors in addition to what you have now, the one or two large electric traction motors in the, in the EVs, but you know, your seats, your mirrors, your windows, et cetera. And these are the types of, uh, of power functions that I'm talking about that are driven with by, by our magnets. So um, it, it's, a, it's a great business that we have with automotive. More than 50% of our uh, magnetic materials and magnets business are, is with automotive. Uh, on the other hand, we were very close to all these uh, tier one producers, especially in Europe and Japan, who are now really pushing us hard to, to go, to get into the centered magnet business as Europe is driving towards greater self-reliance on rare earth, rare earth magnet, rare earth motor supply chains. And we're responding. We, we've had a number of conversations with, um, with the OEMs in Europe, with the uh, tier ones in Europe, as well as um, uh, the various governments um, in, in the EU and in the member states. And um, we're putting the finishing touches on a, on a plant that we will start, I expect that we'll start building in, um, uh, in Estonia as an expansion to our existing facility where we'll take our separated rare earths. So instead of sending those rare earths you know, into Asia, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia, et cetera, or the United States, we'll, we'll turn them into metals neodymium, presidium, and metal, and perhaps heavy rare earth metals, we'll then take those metals, make them into alloys, and the alloys into magnets. And, and, and keep in mind that we already do about 80% of this uh, today in China and in Thailand in our existing facility. So we don't have to reinvent the wheels and, 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 and learn, you know, we don't, our learning curves are not all that steep. So yeah, we're getting there because we think it represents a massive opportunity. Uh, and, you know, as you pointed out earlier, Jack, the, the Estonian plant that we have is the only commercially operating plant in Europe of its kind, and it's a massive strategic asset. So we, we fully intend to capitalize uh, on, on that fact. Constantine, that, that really segues into a whole other uh, point that, that, uh, that I want to bring up. You know, we're talking about a lot of things that, that you know, early on we discussed, you know, being old. Uh, but, but we're talking a lot of things that you can only do if you've been around for a while. And I, I remember talking with you, this is, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, and you were talking about how you had spent literally decades establishing, your, you know, yourself and in previous uh, corporate versions of what you are now. 
as a, as a, as a trusted supplier within this chain. I mean, nobody just sort of shows up with a bushel basket and says, hi, I've got this product here. Would you like to, you know, use this in your, in your car, your jet airplane? No, 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 it doesn't work that way. You, you have to establish yourself. So here you are with this credibility that you've built over, you know, decades and, you know, massive supply chains and lots of, you know, very smart people who work for you over the years. And out in the rest of the rare earth space, we see lots of small operations, let's, you know, relatively speaking, you know, mining companies, exploration companies, who all come up with these great, great saying, oh, we've got this high grade deposit here. We've got this high grade deposit there. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And they're going to come up with some sort of a product, you know, some sort of a concentrate, you know, ideally. And are, are you going to be buying that from them? Because I don't see a lot of these, you know, exploration and, you know, so-called mining plays turning into what you're doing. They're not going to be selling magnets to Volkswagen or anything like that. What's your comment on that? Yeah, well, um, yeah, Byron, listen, both with you and with Jack, over the years, we've, we've had this discussion about how difficult it is to, um, to do what, I guess, we do. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, um, I, in perhaps in more conversation with Jack, um, I've sort of commented on some of the mistakes of the junior mining, uh, in the junior mining space that I've seen over the years. You know, I'm, I don't want to be critical, but... Mm -hmm. I think um, the when when a junior mining company whose skills are exploration, geology, mineral processing, etc., decides to be a magnet company, what un unless you've been in the field and, and your 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 knuckles have worn out and uh, uh, and you've been beat up by some really really smart people around the world, um, you really don't have a true appreciation of what it takes to to, to sell either a, a separated rare earth that makes very demanding specs on both chemical and physical properties. And the physical part is the really hard part. That's where material science needs to kick up into a, another level. But when you're making a magnet, you're talking about a field of study and development that is you know, light years away from you know, de developing a deposit on the ground. And I think the mistake that a lot of junior miners made in the last um, run up to, to prices when everybody was, uh, was developing rare earth projects uh, around the world is that the skill set that you need to get a project off the ground are vastly different from the skills you need to separate the rare earths, to turn them into metals and eventually turn them into alloys and magnets. You know, it's, 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 it's very different now, unless you have very deep pockets and very patient investors, um, it'll take you a decade. Uh, some of the, I mean, one of my favorite projects that, that we worked on is the project with Honda, where we developed a, a new electric motor that Honda tells us it's the most energy efficient in the world, and they use it in all their uh, electrified drivetrains. It's a traction motor, and it uses magnets that our customers in Japan, Daido, are making, and we made a dedicated magnetic material. We played around with the composition, the chemistry, the morphology, in order to get the right magnetic properties that Daido needed in order to make that magnet that now goes to Honda. That was a seven-year project. It was a seven-year project having Honda, Daido, and Neil, three companies that, you know, perhaps, you know, if I may say so, were at the top of our game in our respective industries, and it took us seven years, 150 different iterations. And, you know, it, it takes time and it takes smart people. And, you know, I'll exclude myself from this conversation. We have a lot of really smart kids uh, working uh, around the world, but it takes a lot of smart people who are dedicated. It takes a long time to get it right. And, and this is what I guess some of the folks, some of the smaller companies that haven't been around for as long, they don't have the scars on their backs uh, and, and the experience, uh, what it takes, you know, don't usually underestimate. I mean, they did it 10, 12 years ago, and I, I see some of these signs again today. Although having said that, this is not a knock on, on any of the bigger folks with deep pockets. I think MP Materials, for example, they have so much money and, and they have a very robust balance sheet and they have a collection of very good people. So I would think that a company like that, given enough time, they should be able to, uh, to get it right. Should is the operating word here. You know, I want to add one, one more thing or ask one more question along these lines. We've been talking about magnets and alloys and things like that. There's a 
part of your company that's in, in a very intriguing space and it's called water purification. And when you look around the world, I mean, one of the, I mean, the, there's a lot of problems in this world with, you know, with just fresh water and water availability. And you, you're doing some astonishing things there too. But can you give a quick uh, description of the water, the water purification side? Sure. To, to give credit where credit is due, this is a project that was started by Mollycorp about uh, 10 years ago. Um, because Mollycorp, given how much cerium it, has, it had in its deposit, they needed to figure out what to do with the cerium. Because today, the cerium market is in a huge oversupply. There's way more cerium produced than people want to use. So they developed um, a process to use cerium and lanthanum as a wastewater treatment material that, um, that eliminates phosphates out of wastewater. Well, following uh, Mollycorp's restructuring, Neil kept that technology uh, and we, we've taken it to the next step. So today we sell a few thousand tons of uh, cerium and lanthanum based materials to the wastewater treatment industry around the Great Lakes primarily. Um, and that's because as we go on, the specs, the, um, the discharge limits for phosphate uh, and phosphorus containing compounds mm -hmm. is dropping to very, very low levels, one part per billion kind of thing in some jurisdictions. And the only way to get there is this technology. Uh, conventional technology will take you down to a few ppm, about parts per million, but then you need to keep going further. And the rare earths in the right shape and size and formulation and, and the right characteristics show tremendous affinity for phosphates. Uh, it's not that you remove it and then you move the problem somewhere else. They complex phosphates very strongly, almost in an irreversible chemical reaction in a very nice big crystalline um, shape. And you can easily filter it out and, and you know, safely land farm it. It doesn't leach back out and, and so on. So that way you eliminate phosphates from getting out into large bodies of water. And then the, the driving force here is that phosphates and phosphorus chemicals uh, are the primary nutrient for algae growth. So wherever you have algae blooms, if you can eliminate the, pho the phosphor um, uh, source, then you can deal with the algae. And, and that's what we've been doing. Now we, we've launched it into Europe. We will take it globally. And we're looking always at uh, potential alliances that would allow this business to grow faster um, into markets that, you know, clearly the demand is there driven by regulatory um, changes. Sort of a divine justice there, because not not a few rare earth minerals um, in, are in the apatite family, which is a phosphor right. phosphorus based uh, mineral. So you, you take the mineral, you turn, you remove the rare earths, you take the rare earths, and you remove the phosphorus, and you prevent the eutrophication of lakes or bodies of water. So yeah, that's a that's a terrific strategy. I think there's a big growth in front of that. Jack, did you have a last question for Constantine? Uh, just one uh, short question. When are you going to introduce your total supply chain concept into the United States? Well, that cannot be a short question, Jack. Well, I'm hoping <laughs> let's say the short answer would be in the next couple of years, two to three years, I would hope. But it really will take um, a, a much different marketing and regulatory pull push uh, that we've seen so far. So in Europe, we're being led by our customers and their customers. And that sort of environment has yet to materialize in North America. Um, in, when, when it does, we'll be right there. In Europe, you're seeing an industrial policy, aren't you, by the EU? And we don't have that in the United States. That's a big problem, in my opinion. Uh, that, that's a, a correct observation, Jack. Yeah, in Europe, it started with the EU. And I think the EU learned some lessons from China, how China sort of developed the whole EV industry to the point where China is the leading producer and the le leading uh, market for EVs in the world. They're absolutely determined to dominate that space. And, and that then, um, you, can, you can reach the right conclusions as to why China is a regulatory environment is doing the things that, that it's doing, whether it's market supply chains, et cetera. Europe has learned, I think, from, from that playbook and they have put in regulations all, both in terms of generating uh, consumer demand for, for EVs and, and, 
energy efficient appliances, devices, etc. But also now they're putting the finishing touches on the supply chain uh, industrial strategy. They started with batteries. Every battery producer in the world has built a gigafactory in somewhere in Europe, uh, in Germany or in Scandinavia. So Europe, the European automotive industry is becoming self-sufficient in batteries. And now they're really putting the finishing touches on uh, drivetrains for EVs, uh, starting with rare earths and rare earth magnets. So clearly it, it takes an industrial strategy to get this right in the shortest amount of time possible. And that amount of time is like two, three, four, five years. It's not uh, one year or six months. So it, it takes time, but it also takes informed, smart folks doing the right things at many different levels. In North America, as you said, you know, industrial strategy over the, uh, over the last few decades has become a bit of a four letter word. Uh, as we, you know, detest too much government involvement in too many things, but there is a role for government. And, and, and I think the Europeans uh, figured it out here. Uh, and I think they're doing the right things. Okay. And we need to learn from that as well. Both yes. my, my government uh, in Canada, as well as, uh, as yours in the United States, uh, there's all kinds of lessons to be learned and we should not be reinventing wheels uh, ad hoc, but Anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm pontificating here unnecessarily. No, that, that, no that's great. It's, it, it is an absolute pleasure and a privilege to, you know, have, a, have this discussion with you. Uh, you know, sad to say that, you know, they, 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 we, can't, we can't talk with you all day, although we could. Uh, you have things to do <laughs> and a company to run. And, uh, you know, our, 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 our publisher wants to, you know, bring it into, you know, endless uh, videos. But... This has been such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for your valuable time and your incredible uh, insight, which is just so deep and so uh, deeply informed. Uh, Jack, thank you. Constantine, thank you. Uh, thank to you the viewers heart. out there, thank you. And uh, take take a good hard look at Neil Performance Materials. It's a it's a company with it's a company on a mission and it's going places. Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Jack.